Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali Museum. It's a beautiful March 9th in St. Petersburg, and we're so happy tonight to have Nancy Mitchell and Angie Estes with us uh, for Poetry at the Dali. Our series is curated and hosted by Helen Pruitt Wallace, a uh, former poet laureate of St. Petersburg, a fine poet and a great supporter of the art. We are supported as well by the city of St. Petersburg and by all our common love of poetry and the arts and what they can do to uplift and direct our humanity. So welcome to Poetry at the Dali. As is our tradition, we ask Helen Pruitt Wallace to read a poem she has written for this occasion before welcoming our poets. Helen? Thank you so much, Hank. And thanks to all of you all for joining in for the Dolly Poetry Series. I'm Helen Wallace, and I'm so happy to have you with us. And I'm super excited to have our poets tonight. We have Nancy Mitchell and Angie Estes, and um, it's going to be a terrific program. So welcome to all of you. Um, I want to do a shout out to the city. Thank you for supporting our program going on eight years now. So um, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Couldn't do it without the terrific museum and the museum staff that helps us uh, produce these poetry programs. So I will do as Hank uh, requests and read one of my own poems. Um, Let's see, and I think most of it is is pretty much on the page. I think you'll be able to get the gist of it. It's called Finding Your Flip Phone Two Years After Your Death. In a box with your charger, wallet, and comb, I stick it in my pocket just to feel the weight of it, my thumb flicking the cover and nubbed keys. I didn't intend to plug it in, Thought I purged myself of you, but it felt warm against my hip. And as day pitched into night, there it was, a pulsing light that cast your presence in the room. Where did I expect your will to go, that surge of you? In death, as in life, you're persistent. I play your earnest voice over and over. You promise to soon return my call. Believing you was never a safe choice, but one I make again. Okay. It is my utter delight um, to have our two poets uh, with us this evening. We've got Angie Estes um, and Nancy Mitchell, and they will both be reading their poems tonight for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll segue into our Q&A. Um, and I'm first gonna introduce Angie. Angie is the author of six books of poems, most recently Parole, published by Oberon College in 2018. Her previous book, Enchante, and I may not be pronouncing that right, forgive me. You are. <laughs> okay. Also uh, published by Oberlin in 2013, won the 2015 Kingsley Tough Poetry Prize and the Audre Lorde Prize for Lesbian Poets. And Trist, Oberlin 2009, was selected as one of two finalists um, for the 2010 Pulitzer Prize. Um, Shane New uh, was published in 2005, and her second book, Voice Over, Oberlin 2002, won the Field Poetry Prize and was also awarded the 2001 Alice Faye de, Cast de Castagnola prize from the Poetry Society of America. Her first book, The Uses of Passion, published by Gibbs Smith in 1995, was the winner of the Peregrine Smith Poetry Prize. A collection of essays devoted to Estes work appears in the University of Michigan Press under discussion series, The Allure of Grammar, The Glamour of Angie Estes Poetry 2019. It is such a delight, Angie, to have you here. Um, I stumbled on your work and also Nancy's um, 
in Plume, which is one of my very favorite literary magazines and edited by Danny Lawless, who is a Dali poet. He's read for us before. Um, and um, just a wonderful conversation slash interview that that the two of you, Nancy and Angie, had and was just blown away, um, not, not only by uh, your poems, Angie, but also by the, the very smart and eloquently stated questions that, that you wrote, uh, Nancy. So that's what prompted my wanting to try to pull us all together. And so thankful that you're here. So I uh, would love to hear from you now, Angie. Thanks so much, um, Helen. And that was a beautiful poem that you, that you read. Um, and thanks for that, for that very nice um, introduction. Um, thanks to all of you there at the Dali um, for having this wonderful series and for inviting Nancy and me to join you. Um, it's a treat to be here reading with Nancy because, as I was saying earlier, uh, Nancy and I have worked together um, over a couple of years from afar, but we've never actually met, and at least now we're meeting virtually. So, um, so that that's uh, it's wonderful, and also. Um, Thank you to Danny Lawless, um, to whom I am endlessly grateful and who does so much for, um, for, for poetry. Um, I think I will begin actually with an older uh, poem um, that I sometimes like to begin a reading with because um, it reminds me uh, where poems live and why we, why we go there. Um, and then after that, I'll read from uh, my new manuscript I'm working on. Um, if, if any of you are fans of the great film star uh, from the 30s and 40s, um, Rita Hayworth, um, then you know undoubtedly that her most famous film is Gilda. Um, and this poem opens with some of her lines from that film. Uh, and along with Rita Hayworth, um, whose real name was Margarita Cancino, um, co-starring in the poem, is St. Augustine. And the poem has an epigraph, which again are a couple of lines that Gilda speaks in the film. And the epigraph reads, if I'd been a ranch, they would have called me the bar nothing. <laughs> True confessions. I can never get a zipper to close. Maybe that stands for something. What do you think? I think clamor is its own allure. Thrashing and flashing, a lure, a spoon as in spooning, as in Lamour in Scotland, where I once watched the gorse twisted hills unzip to let a cold blue lake between them. St. Augustine says the reason why humans behave as they do is because they're not living in their true home. In Rita Hayworth's first film, for example, Dante's Inferno, is a failing Coney Island concession, and Margarita Cancino plays the part of Rita Cancino, playing herself. And the true home of glamour, by which I mean, of course, the grammar of glamour, is Scotland, because glamour is a Scottish variant of grammar with its rustle of moods and desires. Which brings us back to the zipper and why we want it to close each hook climbing another, the way words ascend a sentence, trying on its silver suture, light clothes. In a satin strapless gown, Gilda slowly peeled off her black arm length gloves, showed how to strip down, diagram a sentence, put the blame on main boys. In 1946, a pinup of Rita Hayworth and the name Gilda rode on the side of the atomic bomb tested at Bikini Atoll. It was summer, and you could buy a record, hear the sound of her beating heart. By her last film, The Wrath of God, her hair was a burning bush. She couldn't remember her lines, whether it's memory or loss we're in need of most, to remember the way home or forget who we are when we get there. Every man I have known has fallen in love with Gilda and wakened with me. St. Augustine asked, but when I love you, what do I love? He asked the earth, 
and the breeze, perfume, song, flesh, the sun, the moon, and stars. My question was the attention I gave to them, and their response was their beauty. The swallows come out like stars, wallowing in the dim evening light. Because in the country of blue, at times, even the borders of the heart are the borders one needs to leave. So I waited at the airport, a woman beneath a sign that said, Gate B, hold. What Eloise and Abelard must have been feeling when they named their son Astrolabe an instrument for determining one's position in the universe. The room where they met in secret was not far from Pont Neuf, the new bridge, which is the oldest bridge in Paris. And like the French grammatical liaison, it puts something hard, something voiced between two vowels, like the sound you make when I am finally inside you. It's the way scientists knew they had discovered a new group of blue whales. They were singing a song no one had ever heard. Inside Hagia Sophia, above the southwest entrance, Justinian, on the left of the Virgin in the mosaic, offers her Hagia Sophia which holds the mosaic. On the right, Constantine holds out to her Constantinople, which contains Hagia Sophia. Small African birds known as honey guides, skilled at locating beehives, but unable to break into them to feed, attract humans with a call and then lead the way. For three million years, People have opened and emptied the hives, leaving just enough for the birds to keep them coming back to call again, like some almost immaculate conception or mise en abîme in which one places a copy of an image within the image itself to make an infinite sequence. Signs posted in the Paris Metro say, attentif ensemble, reminding us to be watchful together apparently against the appearance of whoever is not watchful with us. Remember when we used to be able to call collect, sometimes even person to person? And there was a party line, not the one we'd have to walk, but the one we'd listen in on. Holding the black receiver to the ear was like watching Della Francesca's Madonna del Parto unbutton her dress, only to find inside Another Madonna unbuttoning her dress, like watching the dead flying, like wild geese through fog. There, not there, there, not there, not there. Yet all the while, you hear them. Yours truly. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Every book I had ever read came back to read me, along with the 474,500 migrating birds that, according to BirdCast, have crossed over Champaign County, flying south so far tonight. American red starts, Swainson's thrushes, gray catbirds, white crowned sparrows, rose-breasted gross beaks. Even now, 325,500 birds are in flight at an attitude, I mean altitude, of 1,700 feet and a speed of 27 miles per hour. While across the Atlantic at Paris Fashion Week, two men waving canisters of Fabricon's liquid fiber circle 
and spray a dress onto an almost naked model. When the white downy sheath is complete, another woman steps forward and shapes shoulder straps with her hands, sliding them off the shoulders before cutting a slit up one leg from floor to thigh. Still, so many questions. Will I love you forever or leave you forever? And will forever be long enough to do both? Like Huck, I reckon I got to light out for the territory, out where you knew the way to my house, the way a blood clot knows the way to a heart. There's a, a vu in this poem, V-O-U-S, um, which is, of course, French for, for you. Um, and Helen, you passed the French test with flying colors, by the way. Um, and so it's a, it's the formal you that you use for someone that you don't know well, as opposed to the one you use with your, your friend, too. The present was tense. The past was here. The air so warm and loft, you could toss it around your neck like a scarf, like the lambs from the island of Luçon off the coast of Brest, Presale, salt meadow, fed on sea salted grass so that their flesh becomes tender while their hearts are still pumping. According to the Talmud, there are four things which it is better to wish that you had never been born than to think on. What's above, what's below, what's behind, what's ahead. But still, on the hills above Otsuki, on the coast of northern Japan, with an old-fashioned black telephone connected to nothing, nowhere, the living make phone calls to the dead. Just as God himself, when he's alone, sits way up in the top corner, bird's nest seats of the Opera Garnier in Paris, from where he sees the stage, only if he stands, he leans to the side and sings, Rumi, with that voodoo that you do so well. This poem refers to um, a shopping list that uh, Galileo made um, when he was living in, in Padova um, and planning to go over to Venice. Privilege for the vocabulary. Among random entries scattered on Galileo's shopping list for making a telescope, something specific but not relevant for the instrument and by no means something you could shop for. Like Tosca's dress, which you're redesigning for a more voluptuous soprano, just as you let out the seams of this poem. Oh, reason not the need, and I knew not seems, but still one wants to know what kind of thing this thing is. Turns out it's not a song by Cole Porter, but a reminder to obtain the authorization to publish the first dictionary, vocabulario, of the Italian language, a privilegio attached to the list as if it were a ledge to hold on to or jump off of, as if just the right word, le mot juste, could split open the heavens the way you open beneath me and speak rapid Russian phrases that I, a woman stitched to earth, and one worn language will never know the meaning of. Spring. Everything is in such a hurry. Even though I'm sure Faulkner was right when he said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. One day the service berry tree flashes red and yellow with cedar wax wings, and the next, nothing but leaves. 
The squirrel lies in a bright red halo of blood on the asphalt, its right arm still running. Even as the halos of martyred saints Cosmos and Damien keep rolling with their heads in Fra Angelico's painting. If they were in Japan, they could be put back together like broken pieces of porcelain. Kintsugi, repaired with a thick seam of lacquer and gold. The past could be morning sky or evening sky, even even song, golden caviar on buttered toast, as if lure and velour had suddenly turned into each other. The past is so unwilling to stay where we put it that we had to give it its own conjugated tense, past imperfect, in which no matter what may happen, the past continues, as in Je Désirais, the condition was never ending. I'll just read two more poems. Shopping list for things now useless that recall the glorious past. The small stones I will keep, even though I no longer remember where they came from. Artillery balls and iron or stone bowls to grind concave and convex lenses. A photo of the moon rising over the lagoon. Something at a distance of nine miles appears as if it is only one mile away. A song no one has heard. Galileo's shopping list for his trip to Venice. Pieces of mirror, lenses to make a more powerful telescope. Your words, let's not ever fight again. The moons of Jupiter, he discovered with his new telescope. The fur slippers and hat that Galileo's son has undoubtedly worn out by now. And the ivory combs, which have lost their teeth. Memory, the mast of a ship diagonal in the sand. And Venice itself, of course. So many bridges, but which one to take? The domes of its churches still full, like breasts thrust into the morning sky. And the title of um, this last poem um, is the translation of the um, Italian uh, tempo notation that appears later in the poem. Slowly, but not too much as if making your way through an alphabet, beginning with alpha, as if you stood in front of the Archimboldo paintings in Vienna and someone said, spring is in the Louvre, springtime is in Paris. Sometimes we were word for word, sometimes unspeakable, like the painted stone angel in Dijon, who has been grieving silently over the passion of Christ since the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th century. As if someone had said to her, adagio, ma non tanto. Think of the joy of making it onto the train before it departs, or the sudden blossom of what's possible when you arrive a minute late and watch it pull out of the station. Behind her, the angel's wings remain unfurled, as if they might fly. She still wears her favorite color, chips stone blue. My favorite is Omega Mayhai, and yours, Venetian red and vanishing. Thanks so much. Wow, that was an amazing Amazing reading, Angie. I feel washed you know, with so many images and, and the way you move in time and space and worlds. And um, that was really, really fabulous. And I look forward to our Q&A so we can talk a little bit about how you managed to do that. <laughs> so, um, but now it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Nancy Mitchell as our next reader. Um, 
Nancy is a 2012 Pushcart Push Prize recipient um, and the author of The Near Surround, um, The Grief Hut, and The Out of Body Shop, and also the co-editor of Plume Interviews One. Her poems have or will appear in such journals as Agni, Green Mountain Review, Plowshares, Thrush, Washington Square Review, and others. Mitchell serves as the associate editor of special features uh, for Plume Poetry and is the Poet Laureate of Salisbury, Maryland. She hosts the Poets on the Plaza reading series live and also on Zoom. So please welcome Nancy Mitchell. So happy to have you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Helen. First of all, for reading that beautiful poem. That was a wonderful way to start. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you to the Dolly Museum for having us. This is a major thrill for me. I was I was so happy to hear that I would be reading with and meeting Angie. I feel like we we know each other. And when I she was reading her poems, you'll see that there are a lot of the same <laughs> we were kind of referencing. And, it, you know, you said you don't know how Angie does it. It's God's own mystery. Let me tell you, I've been trying to parse that myself. And uh, thank you so much, of course. And to my boss, he would not like to be called the boss, but my boss, the editor, Danny Lawless, who is absolutely lovely. And we've been working together for years now. And uh, he's just wonderful, and I think Plume is wonderful. And, you know, I, I think Zooms are great, really, because they're so intimate in a way. They're kind of like these little rooms we get to go into, especially during the pandemic. And I appreciate um, you going to the trouble for this. And thank you, Joy, because I know how hard it is to be teching or how hard it would be for me. So um, I, I'll start with uh, just because I always start with this poem. And it's from my uh, first book. And then I'll, I'll kind of move through some things that have been a couple of new poems, but things that have been concerning me, probably concerning all of us since the, uh, I guess it's a trifecta of horror <laughs> way back in. When was it? I don't remember. But anyway, what about sushi with the Merkels? Merlot or Cabernet would be fine with Martin. What about taking Max for a stroll at sunset? Taking Max. What about dinner with the Dean? Coffee with Don at 10. What about he said he'd call by 11? Hopping in the shower at 11.15, dropping the whole thing. What about she doesn't like to be on top? What about Manet's method of removing water stain from wood? What about mother's face behind a comic book? Brother's face. What about lime neon bra with matching panties? What about a doll with my face? What about a full time phone lover? A phone life? A phone liar? A phony? The silence of cold spoons. And, uh, so this one is called. Free Barbies. Free Barbies read the sign in the Salvation Army shopping cart crammed full of them. Naked, lips smashed against perpetually perky breast, nary a nipple among them. Ski slope noses probing slitless crotches, ramrod arms and legs poking through wire bars. Blonde, brunette, henna and raver, raven haired, Safety scissored butch or banshee wild, flaming above heads as if their brains burned. Oh, Barbies, why so many of you? Did you come in hand clutches or one by one, shucked of slinky gowns, stilettos, teeny bikinis, bling, before you were chucked head first into the giveaway bag? Your ensembles and matching accessories up for sale on eBay? Or were you ditched for bigger tits, fuller lips, slimmer hips, unlike beloved Mr. Teddy Bear, his lumpy gut and worn fur so adorable? Or is it because you were impossible to cuddle, your rayon hair unbrushable, in a word, unmotherable? Barbie, 
the hard B of bar blunted, honey clotted with E. Sweetie, cutie, petite, pretty, sexy, baby, daddy's mini, kitty, pussy, Barbie. Make me a martini, please. But Barbies, I've got to hand it to you. You're troopers, naked, used, abandoned, and abused. And I'll be damned if every one of you is not still bright-eyed and smiling. This one is called Taking Five in the Driveway, and it's for Zavinia. You and me, we be so fly, T-bird convertible ragtop down, lips slick, peep kaboo pink, blonde string shimmer, mohevi mirage, South Shore magic hour, sweet Judy blues yours, full on Sylvia bangs, my wrist sex and silver cuffed, cat eye Ray-Ban knockoffs, yeah. We're knockouts. Leopard print skirts slit to fishnets, weed wisping between us, and not a car key. Besides, we're too fly to drive. This one is called Blame My Mother. Blame my mother if I could, but cocktail hour was du rigueur in the 50s, even for pregnant women. If you don't believe me, go read Cheever. Umbilical tethered, defenseless fist of gills and fin, I twisted in placental gin. At five, first tipsy inch of whiskey, daddy tumbled into my silver baby cup. Cheers. Oh, how I love the falling, dizzy, dizzy, laughing, spinning tree and monkey bars. And in the sky, I saw it, the beaded spiral, my very own DNA stairway. To heaven. While in the body, I was in the body, but not of the body. I neither grew nor aged an alabaster egg. Under a furled rib, caged like a lover, I spooned the heart, bided my time, counting beats to the lullaby, arterial freeway. Traffic of blood. The awe and father. Wanton wanderer. Squander quandary. Daughter bomb. Fog bother. Ah. Da. Farther God. Farther. And uh, these were written, uh, these were sort of, I guess, uh, when I was working on the out-of-body shop, it was right in the middle of um, the Kavanaugh hearings and the uh, Me Too uh, movement. And yeah, so I think I would probably with a lot of people had had some uh, experiences that maybe threw them back to experiences and I wrote about these and and the out of body shop is uh, a shop where people who have been uh, thrown out of their bodies due to different trauma end up and in the out of body shop they're trying to be retrofitted to their psyche and uh, so this is called why I'm here why I'm here I have no clue. It was weird, yes, but I wouldn't say abused, maybe molested, not like the one here who was raped repeatedly or caged or that one, chained 40, 100 days to a radiator. But the technicians insist in layman terms, there is always the initial primal, if you will, incident after which the connection to the body is intrinsically damaged. Think electrical cord. Think frayed. It's a culmination of subsequent less significant incidents that cause the final, often irreparable split. We all here hope to be fixed, but chances of successful retrofit to the body depend upon remembering. Most cases are too far gone. The damage. 
And uh, this one is the intake invoice when, uh, I guess, a psyche arrives in, in the out-of-body shop. Intake invoice. Triggering secondary incident. Female. Fifth grade. School bus driver. Grandfatherly. Smelled of soap and rising dough. Called her Chica Bonita. Ask about books she liked. His hand, blue veins, skin thin as tracing paper, slid up her blouse, the calloused edge of his thumb, nicking her nipple. The whole time he was smiling. Typical symptoms, lightness of being, sense of shrinking. The exit point, the black hole in his eye. God hole, she called it. Static. Yes, time out elapsed, unknown. And uh, this poem is these the people that end up in the out of body shop. I always um, I, I'm working with an artist to do an installation piece with these kind of uh, amorphous beings <laughs> that are hanging in this out of body shop, and when. Uh, People walk by, it activates the poem. Friends here. All we are now is floating text next to a thumbnail of the body we left. We reminisce on all the ways a warm body feels against another body. The smell of rain and how voices heard so differently in dark than in the day. We try not to complain about the constant ache of the phantom body. We try to be grateful. We like each other. We have emojis. And uh, let's see. These are um, these are kind of newer ones, but um, I thought I'd miss you desperately, but your shadow is so interesting. Profile and silhouette, elegant, nose almost Grecian, receding hairline, highbrow suggests a keen intelligence, capable of reflection, new perspectives, every movement graceful, not one wasted step or gesture, perfect lyric in black and white, crisp, edgy, not your usual wishy-washy, fade to maybe. And um, this one is, I've been really intrigued. This is for the, the manuscript I'm working on. And um, I'm really interested in memory. I have two uh, very close people who have dementia. And what's interesting to me is when I talk with them, when they remember something, uh, when they have a memory, it's so absolutely precise uh, compared with everything else that they can't remember. And that would, I just started um, paying attention to that. And I started paying attention to memory and how it can, can, um, I guess it's a constellation of sensory input that, that makes memories kind of become something. And so this is just some things I, I thought were kind of interesting. Sister Dementia Remembers. Enough of bosom, ass, and pillow. It's up and out to get the early worm before the bird, the bone between my teeth before I drop it, the last olive out of the jar. I lived in a brown standalone with a stay-at-home. At the first sprig of forsythia, he laid me down on the table and stropped a razor to get me trimmed up for bikini season. How happy it made him to see me so kempt. When the night nurse slipped out of post-op for a vending bag of Cheetos and a 20-minute smoke, my mother's throat swelled shut. When you sing, St. Augustine said, you pray twice. And uh, this is uh, I've, uh, this is kind of, I think this will be, my last one. I like to, um, this was a poem written after a 
you know, it's interesting when, uh, I don't know about you all, but gosh, it seems like there just aren't any conventional um, methods that really do help you get over someone. And then all of a sudden something happens and it's grace, I think. Today, I conjure your spirit where before it came on its own. This is a good sign. Your letters taken from my bedside table, now stuffed in the dark basement cupboard. They are no longer among the first things I will save from fire. And if a small memory of you should arrive, they will be like the shadows against these white blinds. A bird, a leaf, or some other bird. So, thank you. Nancy, that was terrific. Wow. Um, that was, am I on? Can yes. I, that was so powerful. Those were amazing poems. Uh, yeah. Um, terrific. So they were all so, so powerful. And, and I loved hearing, um, you know, the, the overlap of some of the things you're doing with language, yes. you know, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just so fun. I'm hoping that we can really chat about that, but you're, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's because you both were aware of each other's work, um, you know, that you've influenced each other, but wow. You know, um, I'm just saying that, that the, the sort of, uh, because we've never really talked about anything, I don't think, except my work. probably. Oh. And, um, and I, yeah, I was just, uh, it was, it was astounding. And I love what you do with, with the language and the, the, Echoing in the language and and your ability to read that also is just is is really really wonderful. It's very very powerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you both do that so much. There's so much language play um, in your poems, even when your poems are addressing, you know, very serious subjects that are are, are um, and, and maybe even especially sometimes when they are. But the the language play just adds such a charge to the to the poems um so i i think i'd like to we're going to segue now into the the q a and um i have a i have a few questions kind of jotted down for you but i also hope that if you would like to you can ask each other questions um but i think i i do want to start since we're all still reeling from from both of your wonderful readings um how you how you do that when you when you push the sounds right up against each other, um, a question I, I do have is, it feels so um, spontaneous to me. It feels as if you sit down to write the poems and those sounds come and you just go with it. Um, and it, it doesn't feel contrived, like you write a line and then you say, okay, what rhymes with that? And you go back, it feels much more um, original. So it, could you both just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you see as the power of language and how jamming those sounds up and letting them ricochet off each other. Um, I mean, I, you know, clearly, you know, the power that, that those sounds evoke. Um, how do you do it? <laughs> you know, can you both talk about that a little bit? That's well, so I uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Angie. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, it's so interesting because this is what you and I were talking about so much in that last interview for, for Plume about, because we were talking about Proust and the uneven stones and those Proustian moments and, what that does to you sort of psychically and emotionally when that thing happens in the body. And I, and I think that, and then we were talking about the, the words and the, and that how that the words kind of bumping up again against each other, like those, um, those stones. And I'm really interested to hear you talk about it because I feel like I've talked about it so much and, we, and we've talked about the, the sort of way that um, I think it's Carol Mazo. Uh, the wonderful writer Carol Mazo is just something like language engenders language. Mm -hmm. That something it, it's it sort of moves um, itself, and certainly for me, at least, it's never a matter of thinking, okay, now what's going to? It's like, you know, you you say this or you hear this, and and something else is there. So, but Nancy, you go ahead. Well, I was just thinking. Um, also, what was so delightful about interviewing. Uh, Angie is that I, I just thought, wow, this is like 
almost like having a playmate, you know, to be able to read these poems and race along. I had to, you know, she was ahead of me for sure. But, you know, it, it was just wonderful, you know, as a real physical experience to be reading Angie's poems and talking with her about it. In terms of intention, honestly, I can't claim any intention because, um, you know, I had a, a later start with poetry. I had three kids, single mom, you know, three jobs, all this kind of stuff. So I went to a low residency MFA program and I got in with the first eight poems I'd ever written. And it scared me to death. I went to Warren Wilson and Oh. Ellen Bryant Voigt was the uh, director there. And, you know, I confessed to her that I just, I said, I, honest to God, I'm scared to death. I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like it was capricious and it, they'll be gone and I don't know anything. So she tasked me with, um, you know, tracing Robert Lowell's work from the iambic pent pentameter to free verse. And I pity anyone who had to read it outside of Ellen because it was scansion and it was deadly. But you know, I learned a lot uh, about poetry there. And I th I think for me, it's, um, you know, I don't, I, it's, I just try to, like, I thought of what you said, Angie, in our very first interview, and it just, I loved it. You said you just, you know, write things on scraps of paper, and then you take it out. I was so thrilled to hear that, because I thought, oh my gosh, and you just, whatever sticks. And Danny Lawless, if Danny's listening, he'll get a kick out of this, because he said to me, you know, and I feel that same kind of affinity with Danny that I do with you. And he said, could you give me your phone number again? I need to write it down on a piece of paper and lose it. Okay, so and I just love this, this, you know, it's always this ear open and your eyes open for something. And I think about that first poem, what about it's like, you know, uh, you know, I want poems, I want them, but I cannot make them come, you know, and I can't sit down and say, I, it just doesn't happen like that for me, I can write and then something wonderful might happen. But it's, um, it feels like, you know, some other things were happening here outside of my will to craft a poem. And, um, you know, with uh, reading Angie, I just thought, oh, my gosh, you know, so intrigued with this. And just like I was taking notes while she was reading and she said, went from, you know, even with a misstep, it leads to something else. And it's like proof stones. You know, it's like even the misstep, if you're in this place of trust and if you're in this kind of i hate to use the word flow but if you're if you're in it then even at like attitude altitude you know and the sounds can propel you to the next thing and it's all over angie's poetry mm -hmm. and um you know the word it, it's just like the next it's like leading with your ear but also just letting it lead you along. I feel like Angie's got a hold of something that I've got a hold of Angie's hand when, <laughs> when I'm reading her poems. I was like, <laughs> like wait, wait for me, or sort of like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, in, in uh, Madeline, the, the children's book, you know, <laughs> Clavel ran fast and faster, you know, I always see that image. So, yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of mystery to it. And of course, you have to be working. You know, but, um, you know, Angie talks about the light of, you know, there's uh, things that help you what read by the uh, this world read by the light of another world. Mm -hmm. And um, that really stuck to me because I thought, you know, I started seeing light through the light through Angie's light. I started seeing this world afterwards. So I just have to say you've been a tremendous um, a serendipitous intersection for me to be able to to interview you and spend some time with your poem I mean Danny and I are going back and forth and, oh my god <laughs> he's like so I'm sorry if this is embarrassing you would so much you well, know no because 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 it's been so incredible to be able to I mean again until until we start talking and you ask me those questions and I start thinking about it, I don't know the answer to any of the things that you're, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know because I don't really think about it. You know, it just, it just, you know, it sort of happens. So it's just, um, that's, it's really so, so, so generous of you. But, but I think about, you know, in those, some of those poems that you were just reading, the, the, the sort of the, 
the this this the sort of pain and sort of internal um, sense of the the psyche of and the crisis of the psyche of a speaker in a poem, but the language that's that's doing it. It's almost like Ella Fitzgerald, you know, sort of like doing like you know, but it, you know, with these words. But the words are making sense. They're not just like nonsense words, but they're somehow they keep they're hitting against that sort of psyche, and they're making this other shape of these of these things, which which it, it just somehow seems both at odds. And to completely encapsulate what's going on in this internal state of this speech. Yeah, it, it reminds me of what I think Kevin Young talks about in um, on the uh, the podcast for the New Yorker. It, what you both do so well is you you don't just write your poems, you don't just read your poems. Your poems enact, you know, and you're they're enacting through sound. Um, you know, you're you're creating worlds through the sounds themselves, and um, I guess it also takes, it must take a fair amount of, I want to say confidence or trust in the language. I, and I used to say this to my students, you know, when a bizarre language floats, I mean, a bizarre image floats to the top, trust it. There's probably a reason, you know, that it is, follow it, you know. But uh, but also what I love is that that even if you don't, and I'm thinking of your poem, um, Angie and and I wrote down the exact same thing you did, Nancy. Altitude and and you know that that, that part. even when you don't quite trust it and you question it, you would you put that in the poem. You know that's uh, that that sort of self correction or or not even correction but question mark in a way. And um and I love that 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 instinct to you know to just to put it out there. Um, while at the same time the poems feel very. Um, you know, there are all these whirling worlds and yet they never feel completely out of control. It's, I think it's tough. It's hard to pull off um, what you both are doing with sound, but I, I do love it. And I think the corrections and the, um, the spinoffs and the ricochets just add to a sort of, in, you know, energy um, in, in the poems. Definitely. I think that really is really one of the things that creates the energy. In the yeah. Poems. Yeah. I'm curious, and this is a question I actually had written down, so I'm going all out of order with the questions um, that I had jotted, but can you talk a little bit about how some of that affects the way the poem ultimately winds up on the page? Because from what I've seen of your work, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, for the most part, you neither of you write so much into what you would call a, a received form, an English traditional form. Um, rather, the poems feel very organic. They take on the form of what of the language you're playing with. And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how how language itself is informing the way the poem ultimately winds up in front of you, the format, the, the form of the poem, the organic form of the poem? Does that make sense? <laughs> and I'm sure that Nancy can answer it, but... <laughs> That's why I'm waiting for you, Angie. <laughs> well, I guess I'm asking, is that is that something that you know from the get-go? Do you do pre-writing or do you do free writing and pretty much go with the instincts at the points coming down, the, the lineation, um, your line breaks, for instance? Or is that is that something that comes in later in your revision process? Uh, to what extent um, do the way your poems wind up on the page, how, how much of that are you already getting a sense of from the out, you know, the very beginning of the poem? Um, because clearly you're not falling into sonnets and couplets and received forms. Um, they take yeah. their own shape. So. Well, speaking as a person who can't really make the grocery list without putting in line breaks. Um, <laughs> I mean, truly, or I mean, when I used, back when one used to write letters longhand, it would be the same thing. It would be, okay, I need to like break. But, but no, uh, I mean, that's, that's a, a simpler, you know, question. I mean, I never do free writing. Um, I've had a hard when I started writing, I had enough time getting myself to even write things down. Um, but when I finally got myself to actually write things down, so I didn't forget them, um, there were always pieces of things. And even now, if you can see over here, my desk, which I tidied up, is full of little pieces of paper. And, right. at, some, and at some point, um, I sit down and look at them and some of them I say, what's this? 
and I throw them away. And other ones I write in, in the notebook, but I just, I write them there and they're by themselves as, as fragments. Um, other things, if there are phrases or things, I will actually, a lot of times I'll put in line breaks as I'm just writing there, even though it's not a, it's not a poem. But, and I always do everything longhand anyway, probably because, you know, I'm actually from the medieval period. So um, I, everything is always in, in longhand. And even when I do a draft, when I get to the point where I'm putting pieces, larger pieces of things together, which is the way it often happens for me in writing a poem, um, I um, will have, certainly will have line breaks put in there. But then when I, I never go to a computer until I feel like I understand something about what the poem wants to be. And then when I start actually putting it on the computer, the lines invariably start changing. Um, and sometimes there isn't even much form to the poem that will, because I still don't completely understand where the poem's going, or what it wants to be or where, where it ends up, so. And typically with those poems, do, they, do many of them already have a lot of that sort of the sound work going on, the, the banging of the, you know, the kind of the rifting of the sounds, or is that something that comes in later in a revision? Depends on the poem. Sometimes some poems um, have a lot of that in the beginning, if, if it, then it sort of ends up being that kind of poem. Sometimes it's, there's just some boring stuff and a lot of it gets cut out. <laughs> there isn't a lot of interesting, if there's no interesting sound, it gets cut out. Um, so, uh, you know, if it doesn't hang on to something else, um, it just depends on the on the poem. But things are always sort of in pieces and coming together in pieces. And that's and at some point it will be like, oh, you know, that's this here. And there's this thing over here. And then something happens. I think Nancy was talking about that. But Nancy, what's what's your take on all that? Well, you know, I it's it's also interesting to me because, you know, every now and then I'll get um, I'll think, oh, my God, craft. You know, and then I remember what uh, Robert Creeley said. <laughs> he said, if we were craftsmen, we would build chairs, you know, but and I always think about that because there's always, you know, workshop works on craft and, um, you know, I'll go back and I'll look at something and then I'll revise it according to sort of where, uh, oh, say syllabics. It never works for me. It just doesn't. And then I'll go back to the original poem and it seems like that is what what is working. And I think it's in terms of how, I don't know, I mean, I've written sonnets, I've taught sonnets for students just because if I don't do that, you know, they'll just, it, it makes them think, they have a form, they can, they have to start earlier than the night before. But, um, you know, I don't know, I think it's a mysterious thing. I think uh, the poem itself, and I think an the way Angie was describing it, it's an organic thing. And there's some things that uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't want, you know, and I was reading this, uh, essay in, by Dana Levin and AWP, and, and she's very interesting to me. Uh, she reminds me of my friend, Jean Valentine, who she and I used to travel together a lot, and she wrote from dreams. I mean, almost exclusively, she wrote from dreams, and she'd wake up two or three times during the night and write down some thing, you know, if we were discussing things and, you know, noodling over a problem or trying to, you know, uh, we're talking about our personal lives, she'd wake up and have a poem for me that seemed to be the answer. So she was <laughs> an intriguing human and I loved her so much and I'm so sorry she's gone. Um, so, but she was saying sometimes um, you you have a dream and and Dana talks a lot about dreams and then the um you don't the poem has to find the dream it's almost like you've had the dream and until you've lived it so there's there's this mis mysterious process and it's probably because i'm just kind of a you know i want to believe in all that i i think it it's like the real keen thing what longs for you is most your own you know and so i like the idea that it makes me feel more in cahoots with the world and i I want to feel that I, yes, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I prefer to think that it's, it's kind of has mind of its own, the poem. And sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, some of them and some, you know, 
really particular. I'm a slow writer. I only have three books out and I just, it takes me a long time to, for it to work. And when it doesn't work, I just, I don't like it. I don't want to ever see it again. And, you know, um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I just have to kind of surrender to what it is. And I think Angie's really good on the way, especially with your line breaks, because it's kind of this breath and then it's then then it's backing up and filling in. And it's all because of this kind of, uh, you know, quantum physics, this wonderful, uh, all these lives coming together, what Transtor were called the sister life, life. Which I loved. Yeah. 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 So I, I just love this, you know, kind of hopping between, yeah. you know, hopping between past, present and future and, that's yeah. where I want to be. And I want to, you know, I want to be in, come from reverie where I'm not, where I'm out of the picture. I don't want to, you know, mm-hmm. although they seem personal and there's the I, the poems in the outer body shop are written by different there. You know, I'm writing from different voices of people who've ended up in the outer body shop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I read in one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's, just, it's just so interesting to you. What, what, a couple of things you said, but the poem having a mind of its own. I mean, I truly believe that. And that's the same thing with like, you know, language and language and genders language and that the poem, I always have that sense because well, you know, when people ask me questions and I feel like I, I'm not an imaginative person, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I don't have interesting dreams. I'm not, I don't like, I really like, particularly like fantasy. And I just, I don't think of myself as being an imaginative person, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the experience, um, and I think too, if you, um, um, Nancy was talking about Robert Lowell before. I mean, Robert Lowell, I mean, you know, said, it says something like, you know, the poem, you know, is not about experience. The poem is an experience. Mm-hmm. And and that that is and that somehow you have to figure out how you're going to get to that and how you're going to use language if you're a poet to to get to that and so it's not something that I have in me it's not something that I can think up if I think long enough or sit long enough it's a matter of of just sort of being in the you know like jumping in the river and like you know being there with, with everything and that that's the sort of the sounds and i think too you know, joan didion has that that wonderful essay why i write you know where she says you know you don't tell it it tells you mm-hmm. yeah, so. yeah and nancy i read in an interview that i think uh, um you said and i quoted you you love work by writers who get out of the way and allow their poems um yeah. Do breathe and turn in thrilling and unexpected ways, and you know you're you're talking about those metaphorical leaps, um, and I'm seeing those in, in your poems and and in Angie's, and um, um, and yeah. tr- and you're trusting that they're going to end up making sense, or at least, or at least, if not make sense, at least they're going to help you enact through sound what the poem is doing, and yeah. Um, yeah, it's what all to be, yeah. Don't yeah. you think it's um, be, and I wanted to say I can't stand fantasy either i don't like it and someone i don't know who the more uh, real things are the more mysterious they are uh, quantum and physics yeah. quantum physics and what do you who needs fantasy and then um but also i think it's all always being in the state of receptivity don't you think i mean it's like i am open for it all because i'm desperate for it all <laughs> you know it's like please you know and then it's not it, it, it's the trust but, but there's something that happens when you know you're in this place and it's almost like, I'm not going to say you're, you know, you're not, it's, it's a good spot to be in. And I'm always so grateful for it. And I'm always so grateful to read writers that put me there. I mean, to be, to read uh, someone or hear someone and then you're writing, wow, is that not a gift? And that's how it should be. We should be you know, engendering each other in a sense, because poetry is doesn't belong to any of us yeah. at all. It's not ours. You know, we're just lucky enough to be in its presence and to keep our ears open and get out of our own way. And yeah, it. <laughs> this is not a very good craft talk, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, the other part of the craft that I hear in both of your poems a lot, in addition to the sound work, is just the use of imagery. I mean, your images for both of you, your poems are tethered and and um, just such wonderful images. And you trust um, you trust where your poems go, not only because of the sound, but through. Can you talk a little bit um, about your use of imagery and um, if you were teaching a class, talking to young poets, um, what would you tell them about imagery? How? It has to be precise. You know, it has to be it. It has to be the thing. Don't you think? I mean, or you just can't, it, it has to be as precise. It, or you can, you're, you can write about the struggle to find it, you know, to find, no, it's, it's like this. And then it's sort of like, ding, you know, yeah, it's like this. And I did want to say that, you know, I've taught lots of workshops on sound because I think using Daddy by Sylvia Plath, I mean, she's revealing, she's revealing the persona she's in with every, you know, depending on the sound she uses and the, you know, monosyllabic and multisyllabic words. But um, yeah, I think it's, the images for me often come full blown and that's it. You know, it's like it, they seem to intersect with what is happening. You know, they're, they're, I don't want to sound, you know, but they can feel like a visitation or you can notice something, but it's in that always being in that constant state of awareness and connectedness for me. Um, and it's like, I'm trolling. You know, I mean, the things I've tried to squeeze out of nothing is amazing. You know, my husband's like, no, <laughs> is this worthy? No. <laughs> but then I'll put, let's look again. And it, yeah, yeah. So do you feel that way, Angie? I think it's like just, I mean, you're in Paris for Pete's sakes. I mean, you're in the most wonderful place to be the light and life and all those sensory um all that stimuli coming in, it's impossible not to be constantly. Do you think it's more evocative than say being back in where you usually live? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to think, but it's interesting because I mean, you know, and stuff, French stuff and items and bridges and things obviously get into my poems. But the thing that has gotten into my poems most is the French language. Mm -hmm. And the sort of things that the language do, do, and from the first time I went to 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 France, and there's a poem in my earlier book about you know, hors d'oeuvre, which is the first poem in some book that I have, and and it's about listening and misinterpreting what's being said and what I hear being said, and then in English what's being said. So it's it's the it's the you know the language thing, and it's interesting in terms of. Um, of Helen's question too about about imagery and and students because imagery is one of the hardest things for students I think because they think they know the words that are interesting and they want to put those in their poems and so when they're using using words I always send them to the to the OED and I want them to know the history of that word and who it used to be and where it used to live and what it was doing and how it used to be spelled and said, and all of those kinds of things. And if they do that, they've got you know pretty much a poem on their hands. They've got the stuff to make a poem with that's going to be much more interesting 99% of the time than something they're going to write if they just use the word that they came up with or the image that they that they came up with. So again, it's it always goes back to the to the language and all these things that are that are inside the language that. We don't even know or, or pay attention to unless we really, you know, get ourselves to 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 go there and say the word, listen to the word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking and we're, and we're talking so much about sound driven um, work. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the power of hip hop now um, in our culture. And. I think a lot of that is just coming from the sound itself. And, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's wonderful because I think it is bringing back an attention to, um, to words for their sounds and letting language carry it along. Um, you know, 
to me, I'm still always going to be hungry for the images to be there too. You know, have it not just be sound generated. I want, I want both. Um, I want the metaphors. Um, uh, but I, I do think that that's, it's kind of an interesting thing to see in our culture. And I, I, I think it's a very positive thing. I think it, it speaks to why poetry may be more popular now than it has been in a long time um, because of the, the use of sound work. Um, well, and that's what I was saying too about those poems that, that Nancy read, that some of them just, that what's going on in the sound level in the poems is without explaining anything. Right. Um, this person, we're getting this huge sort of psychic, resonance of, of who the person is through, simply through the words and the sounds of the words and what what's coming together in language so it's it's uh, it's really fascinating well angie thank you so much that's just wonderful to hear i really appreciate it because i'm you know just a total fan girl <laughs> <laughs> of your work i mean it's truly you know and and danny when he said gosh would you be you know interested in doing another interview with Angie. I was like, you better not ask anyone else. <laughs> yes. I'm doing it. I don't and I think, oh poor Nancy, she must be so bored by now. She's already not at all. It's just the doors keep opening and opening. And um you know I've spent some uh, time in France at uh BCCA's residency. Um, Where did you go there? I've got been there a couple of times and it's I, I enjoy it, but you know I just uh, my family lived in Egypt and I went to a, a French girls school. So I understand it's such a odd thing because I don't speak French very well, but I certainly, I can understand it and I can read some of it, but being back there and also the Mediterranean light, you know, is just, I, man, I thought this is, and Ovular is just a little South of Western village. You know, it's not, it's not any, great chicks but i love the village life i love the way that everything's outlined there's no reason for anyone to be coming into any village unless they <laughs> unless they have business there you know and yeah. i just would love to to be there again and more um so i think some places speak to you but you know um yeah. and it reminds me too of like the language and also the 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 spell of language i mean i know that there have been uh you know, there are poets that I, uh, it reminds me, I gave a reading at this um, assisted living facility, and most of the people had Alzheimer's. And this woman said, we don't know what you said, but we loved hearing you say it. Okay. And I thought, oh, okay, this is so great, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's just like the the resonance and, you know, just the mistakes we make in language and how it, if we're not self-conscious about it, or we mishear something, then it can trigger us into another space. So I guess it's just that, that trust and getting out of your own way and not, you know, just, just allowing it to be kind of like you said, hip hop, or even I had a little jazz show for a while uh, in this little town. They started a public radio station and they had this big block of time on Friday, Saturday nights. And I said, I have a good jazz collection. I'll, I'll do a show. And I was just spinning into the void, believe me. But um, <laughs> interesting. Was, yeah, the, that um, the, anyway, just briefly, that, that, that language thing in the French, it's, it's like one of my favorite things to do. In fact, in Paris, there's a specific church that I go to almost every day when I'm in Paris, where there's this group of nuns and, and, and monks that mainly sing, but then they have their, their sort of talking and, and readings. And um, my French is not good enough that when most, I mean, I pick up occasional words, but I don't really know what they're saying. And the uh, same thing in Italy, which I know even less than Italians, but I love to go to church and listen because I don't understand literally anything that they're saying most of the time, but the language and the, the sort of everything that's coming through and yeah. just to be, even just to sit someplace and hear speak, people speaking different languages, it's just so, it's like my soul needs this. Yeah. So. Yeah. It feels yeah. nourishing to to yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and for uh for those with memory loss dementia which also is something I've explored a lot because of loved ones um they you know they, they respond so much to music yes that's, and and I think that's yeah it's a it's a wonderful 
um, a wonderful way of trying to bring back some of those memories, I think, is to do it through sound and, and memory. I just have two more short questions, and then we may have to call it um, a day, unfortunately. Um, I'm curious, can you, I, I think you both said you're working on new manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, would you be able to tell us just a little bit about what you're working on, or would you, if, if that's okay? And, um, and when you plan to have something out with that? And, um, and then as part of that, the, the follow-up question would be, do you have a book that has been especially important to you, whether it's an, a poetry book or not, that you might recommend um, to all the writers out there? You mean like book by someone else in it? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Nancy? Well, you know, I, I keep going back all these years. I always go back to uh, Gaston Bachelard's uh, The Poetics of of reverie is so intriguing to me. I, if you've read him, uh, Auntie, you know, he's hard going. It's like, oh my God, do I really have, because he has to justify the fact that he's a philosopher, you know, but then you just trip into this thing that it's like, oh my gosh, this is changed. This is amazing. And I think in early on, I was really attracted to uh, the imagist. I particularly like Louise Glick for her, you know, I like that stuff stark imagery and with Linda Gregg and um later you know I've written narrative poems but I'm not that I don't know I feel kind of clumsy about it um and of course Angie's work is is profoundly um influential for me but I'm you know it's for me it's books it's music it's paintings it's not you know and I do, do a little bit of visual art um myself but I you know, I, I, I wish I had more of that concentration, but it's whatever, whatever um, kind of throws me out of myself temporarily is something that I don't, I don't know where it's going to find me or I'll find it, but it's a good day when I'm, I'm surprised by something and I don't know anything about it, you know, um, I don't know anything about it. I just saw this thing. We have this, uh, Na uh, local thing where people report where police are supposed, you know, police have been called to. And there are these two men fighting outside of Royal Farms, uh, one with a broom and one with a shovel. And I thought, oh my God, how interesting, you know, this broom and a shovel and these primitive sort of, you know, uh, and just things one man was talking to a tree, the police were called. <laughs> So those things seem to, there seem to be embedded some mystery. And a lot of times, no, uh-uh, it, it, you know, it's not that mysterious, but I'll follow those leads. You know, I think they might have called it something back in the day, you know, like, I don't, don't you think poets, I mean, the three of us, don't you think they're, did, did you spend a lot of time looking out the window when you were a kid? I mean, I would... Uh, when in school I'm now looking out the window and <laughs> being reeled back in you know and yeah you know it was like I I was a you know good student but that was the good student me I mean I would much rather be drifting somewhere and I don't know why I don't know if it's temperament or or what I think yeah I'm I'm impressed Helen, you've got this series together and everything. You probably don't have anything written down on slips of paper, do you? What's your process? You I know, I do. I have a lot of fragments. Um, <laughs> uh, and right now I'm trying to put a manuscript together. And so my dining room table has a whole bunch of poems spread all over, trying to see if any mm -hmm. of them are talking to the other. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, really, I think fragments kind of function that way, too. If I pull them out, um, are they... If I connect a couple, it's because I hear some sort of echo. Um, but I, I, um, I'm not doing it nearly at the the um, with the sort of depthness that the two of you are. <laughs> so um, I need to play with it even more. But yeah, yeah. Um, how about you, Angie? Can you tell us a little bit about the manuscript you're working on now, and any recommendation for a book for others? For a book. Hmm. Um, well, I don't know. I was, I was thinking about what Nancy said about long back when the world sort of opened up for me, which was actually after I retired early from being a professor and teaching, um, and doing all the stuff that you have to do when you're a professor. And when I finally retired, that was, and Nancy, that was when I first started reading 
medieval literature and wow. about medieval cathedrals and actually first started really it was late for me too and started going to France and to Italy and to do it and that was that was the opening of the world for me I mean you know when I was a kid I was always like that and so from being a kid you know sort of details and stuff um, are still in my palms from that but um, but that sort of experience of just putting myself where something mm. to me um, is still really essential still really essential for me um, in terms of the of the new manuscript, Helen, um, well, the all of the new poems that I read, except except obviously the first one wasn't a new poem, um, or in that there's um, I'm not even sure kind of what to to call it. It's a kind of um, end of the world, um, uh, but not literal. It's not like you know about you know it's not echo poetry or anything like that but there are a lot of things happening I think with with language and with art and um, obviously that Proust sequence um, is there so you've got sort of that level and then you've got running through the book these um, this sort of um, very very difficult um, amazing and difficult um, love relationship mm. going through it so mm. so it's a um it's kind of what i call it sort of a, an apoc apocalyptic polyphony um, <laughs> wow <laughs> um it's a great description <laughs> so, yeah so um yeah all, all we need to do is just get it to to all to all work together so it's it's a whole lot of different kinds of things um sort of like in that that second poem i read that one that yours was that the second one third one that yours truly poem mm -hmm. uh, which was which is a really new poem and um i don't know if, if you've read huck finn recently probably not but um i used to teach it all the time but the last words of the novel are yours truly huckleberry finn so mm -hmm. so there's you know, it's one of the things I like about that that poem is you know the birds and the, the sort of Huck Finn and the sort of all of these things sort of crossing each other, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the night. Mm -hmm. um, so the manuscript's very much like that. Wonderful. Yeah. Huck Finn and Proust together again. Wow. <laughs> and I should have mentioned since you mentioned, um, of course, Proust. That goes without saying. You know, one of the uh, most important, uh, what he does with, I mean, he, he, you really have to pay attention. And these little things, just like Angie and I both vibed on, if I can use that happy language of, uh, you know, the, the Madeline and the tea was one thing. And also that's a terrific yeah. thing is that we haven't even talked about olfactory experiences and how right. important they are. But that, you know, I noted that, when I was reading Proust last summer about the, the stones, you know, because he's standing on the stones and they're different and they, they throw him just, just, you know, it's just really probably by inches out of where he's, and it, and it triggers him back to a memory where he was similarly disoriented. So I think those moments of disorientation, especially maybe even in childhood where, you know, you think you're going along and then you're absolutely not, you know, and uh, I, I think it's an investigation. And it's also like you're in France. I'd love to. I mean, I want to go to 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 uh, to places that feel sentient. And, you know, I'm, it, I don't want to be a snob, but I may am. But, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you just want to there's something about uh resonance yeah you know even the sound resonance it's like things are tactile and they're tactile by sound yeah you know and by image and i think we're after that don't you think um absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah well that's probably a good place to <laughs> and I was thinking how I, we haven't touched too much on this, except that the whole thing is kind of about this. Um, you know, we, you both hit on um, how 
the, tr the transformational power of art, how art transforms us. And I, I just want to say that that's so true um, to me of both, both of your, uh, your works. I mean, you're, you're both, you take us places with your work and, um, and your, your poems are powerful and thank you for them. And, um, and thank you for joining us in the yeah. Dolly Poetry series. And, uh, and thanks to all of you all for tuning to tuning in. So, and it's also something that connects us all to Dali, right? Because I think you guys have in the museum there, at least a, a yes. of the aphrodisiac jacket. This week, <laughs> although I have a little glass of <laughs> Yes, right. Well, we'll have to go go to the Dali Museum. Hey, I'd love to meet you. It. It's real. Hey, and you. yeah, this was, you're so gracious. And thank you so much. Really? Yeah. Thank My you. Pleasure. My pleasure. pleasure. Come see us at the museum. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.